Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's EEA Education Series webinar. Today we will discuss tax and accounting issues with digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and DeFi. Today's call has been recorded and will be available to all attendees soon after today's presentation. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is a member-driven standards organization whose charter is to develop open blockchain specifications that drive harmonization and interoperability for businesses and consumers worldwide. We welcome any and everyone to join and become a part of our global community. At this time, we are pleased to introduce our moderator, the co-founder of CEO and CEO of Bitwave, Pat White. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the intro. We're really excited to be here. Should be a, this is about as much fun as you can possibly have talking about tax and accounting in your entire life. And that's what we're here for right now. So we're, we're really excited. Um, obviously, you know, tax and accounting is, is not necessarily everyone's favorite topic in the world, but it is, it's A, it's very important. Uh, and I like to say, you know, people always focus when you say tax and accounting around crypto, people always focus on the tax side, which is, is this sort of thing of like, you know, you know, the IRS comes asking for their money and that's, that makes everyone sad. But, you know, think about accounting is accounting tells you how much money you're making. So it's, it's nice, you know, there's good parts of this also, which is you can tell how much money you're making and, uh, and then, yeah, you have to, you have to figure out how much you're going to pay taxes on it. Uh, agenda for today. I'll just briefly talk about it. Uh, I'm going to talk for about five, 10 minutes just to give everyone a really quick intro to, you know, digital asset tax and accounting. Uh, I'll introduce Bitwave, introduce the panelists. Um, you know, we'll do a really quick intro on just kind of like some foundational concepts. I mean, really like there's some things you have to understand and then we'll, we'll start diving deeper and deeper and deeper as it goes. Uh, and, uh, and so that's kind of where we'll start. And then once, once we're out of there, uh, I'll, with the pan, uh, me and the panelists will basically open up and we'll have a, a long discussion about all of the tricky parts of this. And I, I like to say that, which is that, uh, the, you know, the DeFi tax, like the tax and accounting world for crypto is, it's one of those worlds where you can talk to five people and get 10 opinions about everything that's going on. So a, a very important part of this is us sort of talking about the different trade-offs that are being made and the considerations and, and all of that as part of the panel. So uh, thank you so much for joining. We're really excited to have everybody. This should be, should be a lot of fun. One thing I, we always like to mention, this is not tax advice. This is, uh, and not accounting advice. This is not advice of any type. Uh, this is just three people talking, I guess. Um, please, you know, it is absolutely critical that you talk to tax and accounting professionals about this stuff. A big part of that is that, you know, what you're going to hear us talk about today is, is kind of like our opinions because there is so little guidance around this from, from the IRS and from different governments in the world. So if you are going to be, if you are doing this kind of work, if you are serious about it, like you need to talk to a tax professional or an accounting professional who will give you a opinion that you can basically hang your hat on if the IRS does call, come knocking for you. Um, a webinar is unfortunately not that kind of thing. So, so, you know, as you're getting into crypto, as you're doing all this stuff, please, you know, talk to a tax or accounting professional about everything you hear today and, and have them give you an official opinion. Uh, so really quickly, my name is Pat White. I'm the CEO of Bitwave. Uh, Bitwave is, we're like the market leading uh, DeFi and digital asset accounting and tax solution for businesses that use crypto. So there are a lot of solutions out there for people that are buying crypto and holding it, or if you're an individual that just sort of buys a little bit and does your taxes on it, that's kind of a different thing. Uh, what we focus on and what we're here to talk about today is what it takes for enterprises and businesses to use crypto. And the panelists that we're going to talk to today are, are passionate about this as well. They are, you know, running CFO outsourcing firms or tax firms that basically work with businesses that use crypto. So that's, that's going to be the, the focus of today is very much on, you know, you as a business or your business, you want to start taking crypto, you want to start paying with crypto, you want to start doing DeFi, you know, you have a specific set of, D, of tax and accounting requirements that individuals just don't have. So that's, that's what Bitwave does is we, we enable that solution for businesses. And we do this with integrations into your general ledgers and tax processes and all of that. And we really see this as, you know, we, we like to think of ourselves working with our partners like, like Libby and Kirk. Uh, it's kind of a drop-in solution for adopting digital finance and digital assets in your in your business. So check us out, bitwave.io, uh, and there we are. So uh, we have two panelists today that are like some of my favorite people in the world. Uh, Kirk Phillips is a w enormous number of acronyms after his name, um, but uh, I like to think of Kirk. Whenever I have a hard question about crypto taxes, I go I go to Kirk because he is one of the, the deep thinkers in the space about crypto taxes. So a lot of like, as we get into the DeFi things and all this different stuff that is totally like brand new uncharted territory, Kirk is, Kirk is the guy that I go and I ask questions to when we have something completely crazy way out there. 
So if you're, and, and he also does obviously accounting and other pieces of it, but, but he, he's my go-to guy on the hard tax questions around um, crypto. Uh, his email is there. We'll share, these slides are going to get shared as well. Feel free to drop him an email if you are looking for tax and accounting or tax and accounting advice on crypto. Uh, Libby is my other favorite person. Libby is a, is a CPA who specializes in kind of the accounting side. So she works, she has an outsourced CFO firm that basically focuses on, uh, on how you do accounting and taxes for businesses as a process where you're closing out your taxes every month, you know, how you get that baked in your books, how you close it. Uh, and, and she works, we have a lot of shared customers that, that we work together on. Um, it is a, it is a, you know, this is sort of a brand new world that we're all working in, but it is, it is really exciting. So Kirk and, and Libby, thank you guys so much for, for joining us uh, on that. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, here's the high level topic. We're going to start with just the basics of cryptocurrency, bookkeeping and accounting uh, and, and why this is like, why this is challenging. And it, like, I think at first blush, it's not necessarily, if, if you just ask a random person on the street, like, Hey, is it tough to do accounting for cryptocurrencies? I'm not sure they would say, yes, that is very difficult. Um, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about why it is so tricky. Uh, and then we'll spend some time talking about like, the different business processes you want to build in around this. Uh, and then after all that, we'll start getting, like, if we have time, hopefully we'll have a lot of time at the end. Um, we will, we will get into the, uh, the DeFi use cases and DeFi tax tracking. That's the really fun part. It is, uh, we leave it towards the end because honestly, like me, Libby and, and Kirk on a phone call could literally spend three hours doing nothing about, but talking about DeFi tax issues. Uh, and while that might be delightful for, for us, I'm not sure we want to get some of the intro stuff done here first. Okay. So that's enough preamble. Super excited to get into it. Uh, this is this is the fundamental issue with with cryptocurrencies. This has like become one of my favorite slides in the world um, because it, it sort of expresses what the issue with with using uh, cryptocurrencies at your business really is. Um, and the IRS, this is this is sort of I, I wouldn't. The IRS has never done a slide that looks like this, but this is this comes from IRS guidance around and and different government guidance around how to sort of treat these things. Um, and I like to say, like, if you dig, if you sort of dig in, there was a world, you know, let's say 10, 20, um, let me say like 150 years ago, where you would take a pig and you would trade a pig for some wool. And theoretically, if you were tack, if you were tracking your taxes on that, uh, you would be tracking it very similar to how we're doing uh, a digital asset tax and accounting. Most people don't bump into this in, into this in their day to day life. You know, there are, there are cases where this is this is still used today. So real estate transactions when you're trading real estate happens and, and things like that. But but for the most part, like you don't people don't really deal with this issue of transacting with an asset. And that's what you're doing when you're when you're using uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these cryptocurrencies to transact is that you are essentially you are you are transacting with an asset and that that transaction turns into two things. So on the one hand, let's say I receive one Bitcoin for some consulting, some consulting work. Uh, what I have to do is I have to take that Bitcoin. I have to grab a fair market value for it. So, you know, I, I must've made this slide a while ago at 40,000, but let's say I take that and I, you know, I put it at 40,000. And then that has to, if, if I'm an individual, it has to get onto my income statement. If I am a business, it has to get onto my p &L as revenue. And so this one transaction first, grab a fair market value, push into your accounting system as, as revenue. You then have to keep that fair market value attached to that particular uh, coin. So that coin now has to have that $40,000 uh, uh, fair market value on it so that when you go and use that coin, whether you sell it uh, or you pay one of your employees with it or you take it as a bonus, whatever it is, the delta from what you got it at at 40,000 to what you are now spending it at, let's say we spend it today at 55,000, uh, that, is, that is capital gains and losses. So this is what makes crypto accounting so difficult. And this is, this is what BitWave solves. I mean, this is why we started our business is that, is that you have to take a transaction and you have to track it both for accounting purposes and tax purposes and, and do that in kind of the most intelligent way possible. So that's, this is, you know, if, if you take nothing else from this webinar, this is the thing to remember and the thing to sort of take away is that you are, every single time you are making a, a crypto, every time you're doing anything with crypto, you are essentially making an accountable transaction and a taxable transaction. And in, in other ways to think about that is you are making decisions. You are both making accounting decisions on how you're reconciling it, how you're, how you're categorizing it, things like that. But then you're also making taxable decisions. Like what, you know, what is the cost basis and all of that? 
So this is this is the core of you know of everything we're going to be talking about here is 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 this slide right here. Um, so let's let's start getting into it and uh, and talking about you know first like how do we prepare for this this new world of digital assets uh, and digital securities. So first, bookkeeping. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro and then I'll kick it over to Libby to kind of talk a little bit more about this because it's such a fun a fun topic. But you know as we talk about with bookkeeping, when you see a transaction that comes in. You need to get that onto your into your general ledger. Um, you know this is, and then and then you basically need to track it from time being. Libby, can you tell me tell me a little bit about about how you know this is what Bitwave does, but like don't spend too much time on Bitwave. You know how have you done this in the past? How do you tend to think about this problem? What are some of the challenges you do? How do you close your books? Like how do you make sure you're actually capturing everything? Uh, give us give us a rundown here. So at a basic level. Um, it, it is most atomic level. One person on crypto can send transactions from one wallet to another. And, you know, if it were all that easy, it would just be a simple back and forth with, as Pat mentioned, making the tax and the accounting markers. Um, it's basically managing an inventory system. Uh, however, you know, crypto is not that simple. We have NFTs, we have DeFi and all of that. So um, actually a lot of times it involves reading the technical documents or I'll even walk through some of the code if it's a layer two solution um, and then actually consult with the team. Uh, sometimes if we have to deal with legal things, sometimes it, it's a very complicated thing where you're doing a lot of the legwork before you even make an entry. You're, you might have actually a lot of discussion on how to treat that because you're creating a process. And this pretty much happens anytime either a new technology within a system is used or whether you're using a new token, you might have to worry about the valuation. So you, there's a, a level of processes where you're installing controls where you might recognize the transaction in a software like Bitwave. And then you're also looking at the blockchain or at code and saying, oh, did it do what it did? It was supposed to showing yeah. proofs and then creating records um, because you also want this, the other challenges that there are some businesses that exist for like three weeks. You know, They have something happen and then they take their website down and you need to prove what you were doing that's a very extreme case but it can happen or like something you were relying on natively holding your data so it's it's also involves uh extensive rep record keeping to just show third party confirmation which may not exist in the future so we you know with with bitwave we tend to to create one digital asset account asset account in your in your books uh and then we act as a sub ledger for it um, I'm sure before before you were using Bitwave, you probably did it in other ways where maybe you had a different asset account for each of your coins. Uh, maybe you had a different asset account for different wallets. Can you talk a little bit about, about just, so, you know, you go through this, you get a transaction, you need to grab a fair market value that needs to get booked in the, in the native asset, or I'm sorry, in, in, your, in your general ledger. Can you talk about the different considerations for like how you even set up your books to handle this? Yeah, so you know what I do actually prefer the single entry point into the books because it depends on what kind of system you're loading into. A lot of the clients actually prefer QuickBooks online. It's not the most ideal system from an accounting point of view, but it has a lot of modular things that tie into it's got a lot of third party applications that play nicely with it. And but one of the things that's terrible at handling, for example, is many, many, many transactions. In fact, uh, found that out the hard way once back in the day. So, um, but yeah, you know, Bitwave, like the system like Bitwave doing the, having it all in their own budgets where you can pull your own reports is incredibly helpful. So sometimes you're managing something in a crypto system, but it does actually walk back to how are, you know, how is your organization treating your wallets, wallet management, who is, you know, who are you getting the information from creating internal control processes to make sure that information is captured in a timely manner. So a lot of it is like a step-by-step -step process of just making sure you capture everything and also are in agreement and how you recognize it. Yeah, totally. So uh, Kirk, let me, let me bring you in here because I know you, one of your favorite topics is, is point number two here, which is sort of cost basis and fair market value. You know, a really important part of the bookkeeping process. I get paid my Bitcoin. I need to grab a fair market value. It needs to be defensible because it is, you know, you are you are you are making a choice. You are making a tax choice when you capture a fair market value. That might not be obvious to everybody, so I'll kind of explain that. But you know, if I get paid one Bitcoin uh, and I grab a fair market value of forty thousand, then that is a decision 
to proactively recognize that income, right? I'm recognizing at that moment income of $40,000. And that means that the IRS is going to get their piece of that income. If I recognize it at $30,000 for some reason, uh, that means that I have essentially deferred $10,000 of income if it actually was worth $40,000. So I've deferred that until, I, until you do your taxes and you figure out your gains and losses later. Um, Kirk, walk me through a defensible approach to fair market valuation for cryptos. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great one, Pat. So it's interesting, you know, the crypto market in general is just so fascinating, right? Just because, you know, the sun never sets on the crypto market you know, 24 <laughs> seven. And in the same sense, uh, when you talk about fair market value, fair market value at a given point in time, it's like a continuous moving target. Like there is not there isn't like one price of Bitcoin at any one time. It's like, that's it right now, you know, <laughs> or that's it an hour from now or for ETH or whatever it is. It's kind of like, there's representations of the value from either indexes or exchange numbers and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, now if you had data that was coming from an exchange and that's the number that they used, it would be consistent to use their number because that's, you know, that that's what they've provided you with and stuff like that. But I'd say the, you know, the really important thing. And, and that's, that's some guidance from the IRS there, which is that if, yeah. is that if you're, if you're using one particular exchange for most of your trading activity, you should try to use that exchange for your fair market valuing. Right. That's right. And, you know, sometimes even if you have that data, there's, you know, some of these, some systems have like, uh, you know, check boxes like, you know, best price versus transaction price, transaction price would be the more conservative approach, of course, but, the one thing to always keep in mind with any of this stuff, whether it's for, you know, determining fair market value or any treatment that, you know, revolves around crypto taxes and so forth would be to just make sure to take a reasonable and consistent approach. That's always, always, always remind yourself, be reasonable and consistent. So if you're doing something, you know, just ask those two things, you know, is, again, is that, is this, is this thing that I'm doing here consistent with that over there and so forth? Am I doing the same thing this year that I did last year? Am I doing the same thing with this coin that I, you know, did before? Whatever it is, yeah. And re reasonable is a great is a is a great uh, it, it, like reasonableness is such an important part of this. So, for instance, like you you often see because of the way Binance is set up, and and you know people who who has access to Binance and who doesn't have access to Binance, you often see a pretty big like difference between trading price on Binance versus trading price on Coinbase. So if you don't ever use Binance, if you've never touched it, but you like the price that they're presenting more than something else, like that's when you have to start getting a little bit into the mind of the IRS, which is like, look at, you know, we can, we can all pontificate all day long. At the end of the day, the IRS or, or the tax agency that, that you are used to will, will come at you in the most conservative way possible. So if you never touch, if you never touch a particular exchange and you decide to use their pricing information, that, you know, is that reasonable? Like it's, you sure start having to ask really, really tough questions about about that at that at that point there yeah i just um, actually thought of a brain teaser because you could actually uh you know you could do a, a you know bitcoin transaction buy sell whatever it is let's say on three different exchanges at the exact same time like right now <clears throat> and you know they're all going to produce a slightly different number let's say it was the same you know whatever the same same exact trade that you're triggering right so but they there's going to be a slightly slight difference in yep. those numbers even though you did them all at the same time and you would say, oh, well, that is that inconsistent? No, it's consistent because it's coming from the source. <laughs> yep. Even though at the timing of it, you say you have differences, even though you have the same timestamp. So, so what about, um, so here, here's where it also gets complicated. And, and Libby was sort of mentioning this a little bit also is, you know, you end up in a situation where let's say you get a, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, you know, there's either an airdrop or some sort of new token comes out and it starts wildly fluctuating in price. You know, how do you how do you make decisions about reasonable reasonable reasonableness around that, or is that just where you have to bring in your tax professional and ask them? <clears throat> well, yeah, you know, airdrops is one of those where we still have a lack of clarity on airdrops, like like many other things from a, you know from a tax perspective. But uh, you know, airdrops is really what it is. It's unsolicited property. Okay, so there's already a case law uh, precedent around unsolicited property. So actually having possession of something uh, doesn't mean that you've claimed it or you've triggered a tax event. There's a case study of a, you know, like the book reviewer who would get free books in the mail and he'd take the books, he'd open them, he'd put them on his bookshelf. 
So you'd say, oh, well, you, you have that, like you've taken possession. You've accepted those books. Well, he didn't accept the books. He just got, he did, it was unsolicited. They came to him. He didn't ask for the books. But what actually happened here in this case is at some point he said, you know what? I don't want these books anymore. So he took it to the Goodwill or whatever place was that likes books. And he got, uh, you know, he took a charitable contribution on his tax return that year and he got flagged. And of course the case went all the way to court. And basically the, 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 uh, the, Actually, the, even though he had them on his bookshelf the whole time, the triggering what what triggered the uh, recognizing the income was he accepted them upon giving them away. It's like a strange thing, but that's that's what happened there. When he gave them away to the charity, that would triggered his acceptance and therefore triggered income. He could have also had the deduction as well, but he also had the he didn't include the income. You see, the income. so that's the thing I, about. I this never heard this story. This, this was a real this was a real case. This is a real case. Yeah. Oh. So just because you have an airdrop doesn't necessarily mean you. Uh, that you recognize any income. And the other uh, doctrine that has been around for a long time is dominion and control. Have you exercised dominion and control such that you can sell, transfer, or otherwise dispose of, like that kind of thing? Yeah. So, you know, one of those things could be like, you know, airdrops are funny things. It's like you're sleeping at night and a brick shows up in your wall while you're sleeping and you don't even know it's there. A lot of times it's a red brick, occasionally it's a gold brick, but, you know, so the thing is, is, you know, if you, it, it could be there, but it's like, it's not like airdrops are not necessarily like you just wake up and you look at your bank account and you have a deposit in there. Now that's readily available to spend. Not every airdrop like works that way, right? Sometimes you have to do something to get control of it so that you can then dispose of it. So to some degree, there's an action taxpayer can take to, you know, depending on your timing and when you access an airdrop may trigger when you would recognize what's the fair market value at that time when you get control of it. A good example of this would be a Uniswap case, I was which, just you know, hit everyone that. across the crypto industry. And, you know, they, they stated that their token price was a dollar. Well, you know, I went to Uniswap at their point of launch to buy some, actually, because I was like, well, that's cool. You know, within the first 20 minutes, it was already at $2. And there was massive network work lag. And, you know, it's sitting in people's boxes. And some people didn't even know it existed. And maybe many people still don't know it exists and so the point at which you you, you have a button that says claim min uh, uni which is kind of exercise in dominion control but let's say you got it you're aware of it but you claimed it like three months later because it's just a technical mechanism there's an argument there that you were like oh yeah no i just i knew it was there i didn't do it but you could also argue that oh no that's fair market value now so suddenly when uni is forty dollars a token instead of a dollar a token Oh, oh no, that's a lot more money in tax I have to recognize immediately. So um, there's actually like, you know, almost, I wouldn't call it like uh, the onus is on the individual, but I would say the individual should be careful watching their wallets and be aware of certain tokens coming in because something as big as uni that was had immediately had an obvious and broad and highly liquid valuation. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to say it's not worth anything. So, I mean, it's such a good example because uni, you know, the 400 uni uh, airdrop was $400 when it hit, if you recognize it immediately. Uh, so it'd be $400 of income and then gain loss income on the uh, gain loss. Or if you recognize it today, uh, and I think someone just posted that to Reddit today was like they had, uh, you know, they just realized they had uni. Uh, that's $16,000 of income if you just recognize it today. And that would be, you know, straight taxable income. So huge huge issue i mean you know on, on how you actually even handle that and that's a pretty simple pretty simple one as far as it goes all right so let's let's talk we we got through a bunch of this stuff already uh but let's talk about one thing which is which is closing your books at the end of the month and how you're doing like your reconciliation and all of that um you know libby how do you how do you like to do this <laughs> so you know one one of the things we do is we like a, a, a collect as thorough of records that are related to the crypto transaction. So one of the things, challenges of crypto is, it's not like a bank account where you know a name and can validate it with a name. You really just have an address and some transaction information. And so it's about making sure that surrounds it and is paired with the transaction. Um, you also are looking at your wallet balances to tie them into a balance so you know um, okay, my wallets are worth this. You need to book your realized and unrealized capital gains. And the, uh, the reason that you, so, so the realized would be the, the, the transactions that actually happened that triggered something that's a taxable event. And, uh, 
and can change your basis. And then the unreal's capitalized gains actually put you to where you're you're on the balance sheet. It helps you match that. And that can be, as Pat mentioned earlier, that can be something where you have an item per per wallet on your balance sheet, which is um, if you can avoid that, that can be, you know, it can become cumbersome to do that unless you set it up in a very specific way. Otherwise, it can be pushing like an aggregated asset report into it, where um, you're not trying to force your UI into your aggregator. And then you check off and often, you know, you want management to see and say, oh, is, did you really do this transaction? And you go through the close. And then once you feel the confidence and you review it and it all checks out, then you're done. And that's a great that's a great point about the balance sheet because like the reason that we ended up doing you know because as software we could easily manage pushing in to multiple asset accounts for different wallets. What you end up seeing the reason that we like doing this as a as a single uh, a single kind of sub ledger to a single asset account in your bookkeeping system is uh, there there tends to be. Like, I, like it's always, we, we see this a lot as, as we have businesses that onboard, especially like you start out with one or two wallets and then you have a few more people using it and then you add MetaMask and then you add some, you know, exchanges and pretty soon it, it does not take a long time to have 20, 30, 40 different wallets. And so we're like, when you, when you're mentally mapping this to crypto accounting, people tend to want to map a, a wallet to like a bank account. But that's really not the that's really not the right way to think about it, right? Like the it's you can think about it that way, but there's there's so many wallets you could potentially have, and it's so easy to create a wallet that if if that's how you approach the accounting, you're really going to be in a tough place. So you you want to kind of have some sort of system, whether it's spreadsheets, something like Bitwave, whatever it is, where you're tracking your your holdings separate from your your kind of bookkeeping side there. The other um, painful part is that. You're measuring at the token quantity, and then you're measuring in your base currency. Let's just pretend that's U.S. dollars, since we're speaking in English, you yeah. know. But like, you know, they basically those are two different things. And your bookkeeping system is rarely equipped to handle something that has those two different things. So if you're using it like a bank account and you're using U.S. dollars without having very granular details in your entries, you have no idea what your crypto balances are from that. It, it was not. It's only going to tell you a snapshot of your USD value at that time. And it's a lot harder to know, oh yeah, we have seven wallets and across all of them, there's 200 ETH in them. Just Oh, and, that, and that's that's another great point is that we've, you know, we've had people that have uh, onboarded Bitwave that were, that were trying to track on a per wallet basis. And then they were using foreign, they were using foreign currencies in their, in their, um, uh, in their uh, general ledger to track the different cryptos and then trying to sort of piggyback on the, the foreign currency treatments mm -hmm. from the, from the, from their general ledger system. And uh, again, it's one of those things that like, if you sort of think about it first blush, it seems like it might work pretty well. And especially if you only have like one crypto, that's where you can kind of do this effectively. Like if you have exactly, if your business only ever deals with exactly one crypto, you only ever deal with Bitcoin, then, then you can kind of get away with that. Uh, but again, like, crypto tends to be this black hole that just pulls you in and we see like for most of our customers we see they come in with one or two cryptos and before long they have 10 20 30 different tokens and they're doing all this crazy stuff and that's where you you know really your accounting system is just like quickbooks is not set up to have 30 different you know priced ass like priced assets that are are being tracked they can't do long term versus short term depending on your corporate structure there's all these sort of issues that come into that um, well this is another thing to note too i always like to think of uh you know, talk about the, all the different ways that the accounting and tax is challenging for crypto, but it's like, you know, you really have like a parallel fun, uh, a parallel financial transactional path that's kind of going on all the time. You kind of have a fiat and you got a crypto, right? You're measuring the difference between the two and all that stuff. But like you guys were just talking about like, you know, what's a, what's a balance? There's actually like three balances at any one point in time. What's the token balance? What's the cost basis balance related to that? What's the fair market value related to that? So you have three balances at all one time. You may not know what all three of those are. The one that actually you can determine perhaps the easiest if you if you do know the number of tokens, then you can know what the fair market value is kind of by default. Yeah. But nonetheless, that's there's three things right there. There's another example how complicated this can be. And that doesn't even count when you're including something like layer two, like an exchange, which doesn't have your information on the blockchain. Yeah. 
It, yeah, and that's and that's that's a great point. I mean, as we're getting into the L2 stuff, and I don't think we should spend too much time talking about because it it's it makes it more complicated. But like you know, the L2, you start to have a much higher transaction volume. And so, you know, we're you know, we're starting to see people with millions of transactions a month showing up, and and how you get that accounted for is a very difficult, difficult question. Um, Kirk, we got a we got a great question, which I think would be it'd be uh, I almost wish I'd included this in the slides. That's this is that's on me a little bit. Um, would you mind walking us through just step by step? Like if I get an Ethereum transaction and I want to sort of man, like I, I just got paid one ETH and I want to manually get that into my general ledger. What is that? What does that look like? Just walk me through boom, 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 what that what that looks like. All right. Yeah. Send out an invoice. Let's say yep. got a customer invoice, one ETH. Okay. So you have uh, let's say that's four thousand dollar translation at the moment. So you <laughs> recognize sales for four thousand dollars. I need to recognize, you know, digital asset, crypto assets for four thousand dollars. So, well, and between there, you're, you first you have to go. You you see the you see the transaction. You go and you grab a spot price for it from your favorite right. spot price location. <laughs> now, depending upon you know how you're using it, I mean, some of these things we might not even think of because they may be automated with your systems and stuff, right? Because yep. you've got theory. This is the thing. The other challenge that you have theory versus practice. And in crypto, there can be a big delta between those two. Yep. So, and just and this another thing too, uh, just to add on to where you started in the beginning. And again, the challenge is it's like, you know, when we talk about accounting for businesses is that, you know, you've got to have an income statement, balance sheet, and, you know, possibly statement of cash flows and the other stuff. But essentially all these things have to balance and fit together perfectly in balance, right? So when you hear, everybody hears about double entry accounting and you're like, well, what does that mean? What it means is that there's every transaction has a mirror image of itself. So if you think about the old school scale, you know, like the one with the little weights, like from the 1800s, you go in the store, put the little weights on there. Except in this case, that's just a metaphor for the information. So whatever you have on one side of the scale, you got to put on the other side of the scale so it balances. That means the numbers have to balance and add up, right? So every transaction is in double entry is a mirror image of itself. And so that means that the balance sheet has to balance, income statement has to tie into the balance sheet. Everything is linked together. Think of almost the cryptographic metaphor in a way, right? So that's why you gotta have, a, you gotta have systems like this that are built for enterprise because a lot of these things that are consumer grade, they're not designed for enterprise and it won't work. You have a yeah. this persistent problem, you'll have, it'll never balance actually if you don't have a enterprise grade type of thing. Yeah. You'll, never, you'll never get all your stuff to work out to balance. Your balance sheet won't balance. And yeah, it's, it is. Yeah. It's the tricky one. And I think and if you're doing this manually, the step-by-step -step to, to expand just a little bit on what Kirk said. So like, you know, you get that one Ethan, you go, you grab your favorite spot price. You're going to take that. You're going to uh, get that into your general ledger. Like what Kirk was saying, uh, where you're, you're putting it against the sales and against the digital assets. But then you also want to do is you want to set up a spreadsheet where you basically are tracking that one ETH has a cost basis of $4,000. That's right. Um, that they, and then and then you got to make that spreadsheet. <laughs> then every time you spend anything, you have to look at that spreadsheet to basically say, okay, well, we just spent at five thousand dollars. What's my what's my gain loss? Yeah, it's um, like yeah, again the parallel. You know, there's like a memorandum entry due to go along with the. You know, when you receive income at, and you recognize that at four thousand, using our example, that also simultaneously becomes the cost basis. That's like the memorandum entry. So totally. it's the same, that's the equivalent as, as if you paid me in USD and as soon as I got the USD, I turned right around and bought ETH for $4,000. Like that's the, another way to think about it. Yep. Libby, um, I don't want to spend, we're, uh, I want to make sure we get to other stuff. So, but quick question for you, um, cause it's one of my favorite topics is, is ARAP. So there's, there is a, a very diff, there's a very big issue with your AR and AP um, if you are invoicing in USD, but you allow people to pay you in crypto versus if you are invoicing in crypto. So if I send you an invoice that says one ETH on it, talk me through uh, some of the issues around those two, like basically those two different treatments of, of your, your, your accounts receivable. <laughs> so actually, this is one of the biggest challenges for automating payment processors, not even specifically the accounting side, but the payment side. Um, and basically, without getting into the technical underpinnings, um, if you send uh, if you send someone, you know, let's say a thousand dollars of BTC, uh, but then 
the price moves up or, or up or down up usually less of a problem but like when it moves down and all of a sudden it's received there's there's a delay point at which it's processed through the blockchain which the price could change and your invoice could no longer be fulfilled um and then you just paid gas and then you don't actually have a fulfilled transaction and if this is connected to any kind of software to actually trigger some other event let's say you were shopping or anything it could just be just a royal pain and so having that ui and having confirmed agreed upon price oracles is an issue i find that the the best way if is when you know if it's not when it's not not automated is people come to an agreement and say yes a thumb a thousand dollars is worth 0.25 ETH. This is our strike price. And then you're safe um, because you've already agreed upon it. But if, if both parties haven't accepted that, then then there's not really um, you know, a lot you can do with that. And then the other part about it is it goes through a confirmation pr process. And sometimes it goes through an intermediary management system that may be even layer two. And they deal with zero comps. And so then there's also internally for that enterprise, there could be liquidity issues or just you know wanting to process the the transaction faster than the blockchain is actually processing it and letting it catch up and then the values change like once again or maybe it eats up more gas and it costs someone more than they expected and the transaction fails so these are all just pain points that are slowly getting massaged out of the system as people update their processors yeah we're and like even for us like we're starting to see people you know adding smart contracts for invoice payments um, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll add to that is that's a really important one here is uh, if you are invoicing, so if, if you are invoicing in crypto, um, that picks up special accounting treatment. So if I'm invoicing in USD, then I can just, you know, I can create an invoice that creates a, that, 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 you know, if I'm doing accrual accounting, that creates the, the notation of my general ledger that I've now accrued this, this uh, revenue to me. Uh, if I invoice in, in Ethereum, well, you you do the same thing, which is you have to accrue that you know you have to accrue that amount that you just uh, invoiced for. So you have to grab a snapshot of the current value, but when you actually get paid, there's a very good chance that the the, the value has changed. So you may actually have a gain or loss uh, from when you invoiced in in ETH to getting paid in ETH. So that's another big complexity here is actually tracking the float between what you invoiced at and what you what you got on the other side. So often uh, organizations will have a payday with a strike price declared in advance if and then say you will receive your transaction at XYZ time. That still has its own challenges, you know, if there's network clutter or anything, but at least there's some sort of agreed upon strike price and, you know, and then usually you cross your fingers and hope your crypto is the correct amount to match the USD <laughs> for that strike price. <laughs> You'll either yeah. be happy or not if it matches, <laughs> if it doesn't match. So, yes. yeah. So let's let's talk uh, briefly about taxes here. Um, and I want to talk. So we we've talked a lot about you know having to recognize your gains and losses, and that that then goes on directly onto your taxes as gains and losses on on assets. Um, Kirk, there are a couple different ways of doing treatment for digital assets, there is kind of a, uh, and people might've heard this before, there's a gap, a gap methodology, which some of the big public companies use, but not a lot of the private companies. And then there's sort of a mark to market methodology. And then there's a uh, sort of an asset, an asset or commodity treatment. Um, can you just like at the 10,000 foot view, tell us about the different treatments, tell us about the considerations uh, and, uh, and, and why people would choose one or the other maybe. Uh, right. So, yeah, well, I guess when, it, when it, I mean, it's similar to the way that we have a lot of, uh, you know, we're in a lot of gray areas with taxes. That's really similar on the accounting side, too. So uh, but I believe, you know, the the current uh, let's call it consensus around accounting would be that digital assets are considered a intangible long lived asset, uh, which means that basically the way those are treated is you have to look at it at the end of the year and judge whether it is an impairment loss or not. And then if there's uh, if there's an impairment loss, you, know, you might say, well, what's that mean in crypto? But for instance, it could be, uh, you know, maybe it's a, whatever another intangible asset would be, uh, where you had, where you, you're, you're judging and you got some kind of loss, you do a write down, right? So in crypto, it could be, maybe it's just a substantial change in value. You'd have to do a write down, but the thing is you don't do it in the reverse and actually do a write up. It only goes in the downward direction. 
And I know that there's groups at the AICPA and so forth. They've been kicking this around for years and this is what appears to be the best fit without coming up with new guidance, let's say, or new, um, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, that's the best fit, but you know, I don't particularly like it because and there's a lot of people that don't, but uh, I think that's, that's just what the consensus is, is the thing that fits best. But again, you know, it could be that this, just for example, if you apply this, your coin's going along pretty steady and it just goes, takes a nosedive in the last two weeks of December. You look at the books, uh, make this assessment, do a write down, then in January it comes back up again. So then you got this kind of weird thing where you've done a write down on something and the asset's gone back up. I mean, you're gonna have footnotes that are gonna say what the value is. It's not like that's not there, but it's just kind of a weird treatment I think right now. I just, I think a lot of these things are gonna require new accounting guidance and and that yeah. kind of thing as we as we move along but that if this is the kind of thing that you, there's a lot of conservatism and you move slowly you just don't be like cool let's make up a new you know let's make up some new guidance here you know so well, and this the impairment one always it always strikes me as very interesting because a i mean it, it can be very tax beneficial so you can because it allows you to write down losses but not recognize but defer gains that can be very tax beneficial in, in some ways but it ends up being very strange when you look at a company like Tesla, where uh, over, the, over the period that they've held crypto, their crypto assets have appreciated by more than they have sold cars in that period. And so you end up in this very interesting situation where like your, your balance sheet and your PL are kind of lying to you in some ways. Like if all you did, like if, if you just sort of pretend like you still have that asset at the, at the cost basis, that they got it out, which I think was around like 20K or something. And now it's at 55. Uh, you know, you're, you're really, you're almost like hiding information from, from the people that are reading these, these balance sheets and, and, uh, and have to like make these decisions. Um, so I always find that super interesting on, on all that, on that side of it. Well, yeah, um, just to be clear too, like the, the accounting treatment doesn't mean that translates into tax. This intangible online data thing, that doesn't equate necessarily to tax because, you, you know, basically what you're doing is you've got like, Two sets of books you got the what you call uh, basically what you, you call it book and tax book means accounting tax means tax accounting <laughs> okay so when with the, with the book accounting the financial statements that you're preparing whether it's for a publicly traded company or whatever you always want that to be to to have it be presented in a way that makes you look great in other words high revenue low expenses high profit on the tax side you want the opposite so to some degree, they're in conflict with one another. And of course, you got to reconcile between the two on tax returns and so forth. Yep, that's that's a, that's that's a good way to look at it. Um, so there's uh, a question we, in the in the I see that where do transaction fees fall in the income statement? Take it away, Libby. <laughs> OK, yeah. So um, it kind of depends if you're talking about trading fees, those are often included with the trade itself. And if you're talking about mining fees, yes, those are often, I never put them next to bank fees. I like them separate because um, they can be multiple things. There's mining fees, something like you're running a platform and you're, you're running a, a bot or something that's servicing a contract that might actually be somewhere else. It could be even testing if it's helping you get your software product on board. But if it's literally just to send a transaction to make a payment, then yes, I would say it falls effectively in the bank fee category. Um, and, and one place where that gets interesting is uh, is is uh, dex dex trading. So if you're doing any trading on dexes, you are you are executing a trade and then you're paying a gas. Uh, you're paying gas to execute that, and that's sort of an interesting question where where we've tended to treat that as though that were a commission. And that is, in fact, getting baked into the the cost basis of the acquired asset. That would be capitalizing your fees into your into your acquired asset. But I think that even that would be sort of debatable. I think you know, there's you, you, I'm sure we could find someone that would argue that you should be expensing any gas fees. And I think, as Libby pointed out, it, you should really be tracking them separately. And if you can attach them to a contact, you know, the way we do it is we like to attach them to the network that you you paid it on. So like we would set up where you have like the crypto fees as a uh, category in QuickBooks. And then we would have an actual, uh, you know, a contact for Ethereum so that you could, at the end of the year, you could go through and see exactly where you were paying the most gas, whether that's Ethereum, Bitcoin, you know, another, another exchange or another, another the, network. 
Yeah, the uh, the uh, October uh, 2019, the frequently the IRS frequently asked questions that came out, which they actually they continue to update on their site. There was some clarity there around uh, fees, which that was a good one. We got some, you know, some clarity. But yeah, essentially, I think like you already mentioned, you're basically if you have like a, a crypto to crypto trade, you're going to roll the fees into the basis and so forth. But like, again, if you're using you know, Bitcoin, ETH, whatever it is to, for payment for ops is what I call the ops play, meaning operating expenses for a business, then that's a, that's a, you know, medium of exchange, in which case those fees will be expenses. Same as, same as if you had incurred bank fees for, for making payments. All right. So we got a great question. Oh, I love these awesome questions. Okay. So here's the question. So each, each payment in ETH is recorded as the gross, the gross uh, number, not the net. But if you have an invoice to pay in dollars and you gross up the payment to hit that dollar target, then you'll have an overpayment that you will need to go to a separate account. So the way the way I'm interpreting this is that you, because this is getting what, to what Libby was talking about, was how incredibly complicated and like all this different time variation on here. Um, I'll, I'll answer this just because it's, it's something that we deal with in our system. If I send out an invoice for for thousand dollars, and then someone sells sends me twelve hundred dollars in Ethereum, uh, for better or for worse, what we will tend to do is we will tend to mark the invoice as satisfied at thousand dollars. We'll we'll then back into an exchange rate. Gosh, as I'm saying this to a bunch of people, I'm like, maybe we should do this differently. But you know, we can you can kind of do it in, in different ways if you would want. We would then back into an exchange rate for that for that transaction. There would basically be a, you know, what is essentially an agreed upon transaction exchange rate, which would value that transaction at $1,000. What then happens from, from our system's perspective, or if you were doing this by hand, what you would see in your, in your calculations would be you then immediately pick up a gain loss of $200. So if, if someone really did send you a lot, a lot more money than was necessary because they grabbed a different exchange rate. You, you end up picking up the, the delta immediately as gain or loss. Um, Kirk or Libby, there's probably a point at which you, you need to do that differently though. I mean, like if it's, if it's like 10%, like 5% different, maybe that's okay. If it's like 50% different, you probably do need to differently categorize that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the most common thing that I've seen is, you know, just these, you know, payment processors, uh, whatever it is like BitPay or Coinbase Commerce and any of these things that do, you know, dynamic pricing, by the time it settles, it's never, it never matches the thousand dollars plus or minus something, but typically it's, it's small. So that's interesting about how you're describing it, where just what you're doing is kind of just, you know, grossing up or grossing down an exchange rate just to make it all match. And, you know, I think that seems like that could be reasonable, especially because if you're talking about slight fluctuations, but yeah, another way to handle it is yeah, you certainly could create it in a separate account, a slippage account or whatever you want to call it. And or even over overpayment for the customer. So you could you if you really want to, if you if you're really customer friendly and you really like them, you could do as a additional, you could basically overpay it against the invoice and give them a credit on their on their yeah. account. Yeah, especially if it's a larger amount. And then yeah. If you're doing a lot of business with them, that might add up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, awesome. Okay, well, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, that worked out perfectly. We didn't get to all the DeFi stuff, uh, but you know, uh, we can do another webinar later if, or whatever. Like, there's other, there's, there's a lot of other stuff out there on the DeFi stuff. Um, I want to put this up here. Uh, this is kind of all the different stuff that you need to start thinking about if you are if you are using crypto. Um, and I thought we could leave this up here to both, you know, open it up for questions. If anyone has Q and A. We also, you know, me, me, Libby and Kirk can just riff on a few of these to talk about it um, from there. So, so we have 10 minutes left. You know, if you have any questions, please, please drop them into the chat or in the Q&A. Super excited to talk about them. Um, let's look at a couple of fun ones here. Uh, I don't know, Libby, what do you, let's, let's talk about a compliance here for, for a real quick second here. I mean, are there any, are there any compliance issues that we haven't really covered that we would, that we should cover or talk about? Um, I mean, I would just say that the people should have some caution when they are minting a token and yeah. be thoughtful about their purpose of minting a token. It's really fun to mint a token and immediately turn it often immediately turns into money. I mean, sushi swap turned into a billion dollars in six days or something like that. <laughs> 
but like, but I would say also be careful because um, as much as it's easy to go fast, uh, depending on how you treat your token, there's, uh, you know, understanding your strategy for when you mint a token, whether it's a utility token, whether it's going to be under the umbrella security is really important because you need your whole team, your whole narrative and everything to be aligned to defend your position. Yep. And so I would, and, and that isn't a trivial thing. That is something where it's a moving target with retroactively enforceable laws. Um, so, so I would just be extremely careful and aware and, and be, and, and uh, yes, a lot of people in crypto, you know, ask, shoot first, ask questions later, but yeah, I, even airdrops, sending airdrops is one of those where it gets very dicey yeah. in the compliance area. Well, yeah, because I mean, theoretically, we were talking about this yesterday when we were prepping for this, is that theoretically, if you're doing an airdrop, there is a world, especially with someone like Uniswap, where, where they airdropped $16,000 to a lot of people. There is a very real world where the IRS could come after them. And they're based out of the US. They have US funding. Um, I'm not sure they're incorporated here or not. I should check that. But, but they have people here. So the, the SEC... If you have people, if you have executives or VC funding out of the US, the SEC and the IRS will claim purview uh, and, and pretty aggressively. Like they don't really care about the semantics of where you're of where you're incorporated if you have significant or key personnel in the US. Um, Uniswap essentially they sent sixteen thousand dollars out to a bunch of people that easily triggers the ten ninety nine reporting uh, uh, you know level. Like, like like no no questions asked. Like four hundred dollars at the time, no. But if you're looking at it retroactively, I don't like it starts to get really, really dicey there. Um, about here's, an, that. here's another brain teaser just to tack yeah. onto that because it's like, okay, let's just say for some reason you could uh, do this. You know, you got that, you know, let's say it's, I don't know, 250,000, you know, users got a uni drop. So they say, and they got some way they could actually handle it, right? So again, they'd have to be, to be reasonable, consistent, you'd have to, everybody got the same, well, I mean, you could have had more than one wallet, obviously, and got more than 400. But I'm just saying the example is if everybody got 400, you'd have to issue a 1099 that they were all the same for the same dollar amount, right? Yep. But here's the other caveat. Again, somebody could get a 1099, if that even happened, just making this up, somebody gets a 1099 to report it in income, but they actually either lost their wallet, can't claim it, didn't claim it, so on and so forth. So then you got another mismatch because yep. you really need to claim it in my mind to get it for income. So there's all these little, you know, things that create challenges. I, lo I love that one. Um, two, two questions from the chat that are both spectacular questions. So one was around nightly sweeps because we have that up here on here. Um, I'll, I'll talk to that one because I, I spend a lot of time thinking about these issues, which is, you know, it's sort of like you, you want to establish business processes for your organization around how you are managing your crypto. And so, you know, a best practice is you use a hardware wallet or a cold storage device, a paper wallet or a custodian as kind of the bulk of your crypto management. That is, that's how this should work. Like you should have 95% of your money in a, in a somewhat difficult to get at location uh, like a custodian or a hardware wallet. There's, there's sort of that leaves like the other 5%, which is how you want to think about that. And what we, what we often do is we suggest a couple of things here. So one is you know, have, have kind of like a, a petty cash. Like I, I think of crypto as sort of the return of petty cash. Cause like, that's not really something people do anymore. They use credit cards and expensive fine, all that. Like petty cash is not a big thing anymore, but it, it does make sense. Like this idea of, of having your accountant or your bookkeeper at your business or your, you know, someone with like a couple thousand dollars of crypto in a petty cash wallet that they're using to pay bills or pay gas fees or whatever it is um, makes a lot of sense in this world. And then sort of giving them full access to it, like not having it be multi-sig or any of those things that would necessarily impinge your, your capabilities there, but then using a system that can actually do monitoring. Because that where, where you end up in this case is you really want to be monitoring all of your wallets. You want to be sending alerts. Like if it goes over a certain value or if someone starts you know, trading, you know, if someone has a DeFi wallet they're supposed to be do, doing development work with and they start trading USDC with that, well, you, like that's an issue and you want to get alerted about that. So like you want to find a software, a software solution that actually has some of these like business processes like wallet monitoring and the ability to kind of have these um, uh, wallets that, that are, you know, petty cash wallets that you maybe sweep money away from on a weekly basis or, or things like that. Um, just to, that's how just I think to add it. to that, yeah, I, think, I don't think you can, you can overemphasize the business process category because oh, yeah. Yeah, the thing about crypto is like the number of wallets and exchanges is in orders of magnitude more than you would have in the fiat world. 
All right. A lot of it's the self-serve nature and so on, but just to, to, you know, go set all these things up and not have like thought it out way ahead of time. Like you should really, a business should almost have like a, a flow chart and a diagram. You know, we've got this wallet, this wallet, this exchange and so forth, whatever it is, this is what we're using it for. Here's the flow of funds. Again, be consistent when you're doing it, whether it's like a wallet just for revenue or revenue wallet or just an operating expense wallet or whatever. Be, you know, if you're just doing it willy nilly without any forethought, basically you could, you could uh, complicate the accounting and which means that the cost of accounting could go way up. Well, even if you have and, a great system. You well, could, uh, and the you other know. side is like, I mean, uh, you it it is not unreasonable that businesses, you know, bought two or three ETH, or let's say 10 ETH, uh, to to do some development work with. It's just sitting on developer's wallet somewhere that's now worth forty thousand dollars. Like crypto is such that it goes from de minimis or like you know to to uh, uh, actually like you know real real balance sheet uh, relevant very very quickly. So that's like the other a great that's like a great reason to really think about all your business processes. Like like Kirk is saying is that you if 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 some random token that someone get is holding or like if some of your if some of your developers have been doing work with Uniswap and they suddenly have 400, 400 uni on there. My God, you need to be watching that. You need to be thinking about that stuff. Um, and you also need to think about, you know, certain DeFi protocols. We didn't get into it, but DeFi often requires either a browser wallet or a single type of wallet. It does not allow something called a multi-signature wallet, which allows for multiple controls. So, you know, there's not a really good workaround aside from either A, just having one person control it which has its own challenges or having people share the controls, which has a whole different set of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're entrusting it to programs where you send it out in staking, farming, any number of things that we won't get into, but basically making sure that the protocols are doing what they're doing, making sure the processes are, you know, and making sure you know the behaviors of, oh no, we have an emergency right now. The price of Bitcoin just crashed 50% or is crashing. What do we do right now? Because oh, yeah, those things, unex lots of unexpected events. Oh yeah. If you, if you need to be making, if you need to be making emer like emergency decisions and understanding, like if you hear about a hack on a token, you need to go and see your holdings on that token. You need to have a very good way to do that. Like you need to go and see your immediate holdings on that token across all the wallets. So you can make decisions about selling it or locking it down or whatever you need to do. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, last question, and I don't know, Libby or, or Kirk, either of you guys, which of you would know better. Um, question about 83 Bs for tokens. Do you know, do either of you know the, the answer to that? If you would ever need to do an 83 B? Have done them. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And actually, actually, it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated situation where you're dealing with something like you might be dealing with something in conjunction with a token valuation, maybe even a professional appraisal. And then you might be dealing, you're kind of legally dealing, this is coming from when we spoke with a very accomplished tax lawyer, basically emphasized uh, that it's triggered by the date of grant, uh, which is when you receive it. So you might, but what does the date of grant mean? If they're manually passing it to you, that, that kind of dilutes your argument. So actually some uh, clients have created smart contracts that automate the process to substantiate the 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 ACB thing and also show that there's impartial timing for when they're distributing the tokens because the last thing you mm. want to do is look like you're timing token distribution with the market. Mm. That's a great point, Libby. Yeah. That's excellent. That is a, that's a that's a good question. I had I hadn't even thought about that. I just because 83 Bs are just like the bane of every startup's existence. Um, it's making sure your people are doing them. So great, great question. Kirk, Kirk, Libby, any any final words, final thoughts, anything you wanna you wanna mention? Oh man, like you said, we could go on for hours, and we didn't, even, <laughs> we didn't even get to. But I see somebody talking about, you know, where does the mixer go on the chart? It just goes oh, on the mixer. chart. Like, you got a box, put the box on there, the circle, draw the arrows. That's what you're doing. Yeah, so really, like, really be careful with mixers as a business. Do your diagram for the flow of funds. Yeah, all these things help in troubleshooting, if you know, rather than oh, what was this. Cause you end up with the unidentified stuff. And if you know that you had a process that, you know, you were strategically using wallets and so forth for certain cases, then you can identify, all right, well, we know everything in here was everything in was revenue. Everything out was a transfer so on and so forth. So I know we're out of time, but uh, it was fun. That's, it's a super important one to mention because I will, as we're going one minute over, but you know, we, we, we recently saw a customer that had some, you know, incoming transactions to wallets that they didn't know where they came from. And, and honestly, 
if you're going to take a really, really conservative approach, you have to recognize that as, as revenue, uh, you don't want to be doing that. Like that, that could be, I mean, if that was, that was like Bitcoin, I mean, that could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue you have to recognize uh, because you can't prove where that came from. So you, you know, think, think deeply about how you structure your wallets, structure your organization, flow chart this stuff out, flow chart your petty cash wallets where you're going to pay bills from, uh, all that beforehand. That's a, it's a really, and also come with a good naming strategy. That's actually one that we've learned on our side is like, be good about the naming strategy for your wallets and, and be consistent about it so that you can find it later in your system or on your spreadsheets, whatever it is, uh, and search for it. Libby, last, last thoughts from you. Oh yeah. I was going to say, you know, this is a highly collaborative process for everyone because it is so nascent and, you know, most people in the crypto industry are pretty friendly about getting into conversations about this and, you know, um, so just always, you know, riff off of other people and get, get your ideas out there because chances are, if you found a problem, someone else might've already found one as well. Oh yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, it was, it was really, really wonderful. Let me pull up the, I'll, I'll end on the, the slide that has our uh, panelists on it. Uh, you know, if you're looking for tax, uh, tax or accounting advice, please reach out to them. They are, they are the best in the business. And if you're looking for software that can help you with all this, reach out to us. We're at bitwave.io. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, Kurt, and Libby for joining us today. Uh, please feel free to place your social media handles in the chat uh, so attendees can follow your work as well. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested in the leading blockchain work going on within the EEA, please send an email to membership at ENTETHalliance.org. Again, that's membership at ENTETHalliance.org. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's EEA's education series webinar.